All right, well, thank you everybody for having me, and particularly thank you for, to uh, Fluidime for uh, sponsoring my visit here. Um, I realize that I'm the one here sort of standing between everyone in the room and coffee, uh, myself included, so I'll try and uh, get to the point. Um, there's two things that I'd like to uh, share with you today. One is a, uh, almost a high-level sort of assessment of where, uh, what the current state of play is for our single-cell cytometry and imaging technologies, uh, because I find that really interesting, and you will too at the end of the talk. Uh, but then I want to show you kind of how we use some of these technologies in our assessment of uh, mouse encephalitis, uh, models of uh, mouse viral encephalitis, uh, which is kind of the work, most of the work that we do. Um, so by way of introduction, uh, so I work at the Sydney Cytometry Facility, which is uh, here down in Australia. Uh, this is a, a Disney plot from one of our grad students, which was excellent. Um, this is a joint uh, facility, which is uh, a joint venture between the University of Sydney and the Centenary Institute uh, next door. And this is led by uh, Professor Nicholas King, uh, and, Adrian, and Dr. Adrian Smith. Um, we've got the same trick going on here. Uh, so uh, Nick is here somewhere. Uh, Adrian wasn't able to make it this year. Uh, and the two of them have spent uh, a number of years building up capacity to have a range of high-dimensional single-cell technologies that are av available to our users to meet the kind of you know, more complex demands of, uh, of kind of immunology now as we start to understand cells in more detail. Um, Professor, uh, Professor uh, Fazekas, along with Nick and Adrian, then established our Ramachiotti facility for human systems biology, which gave us our mass cytometry arm, as well as our uh, mass cytometry reagent bank, which facilitates most of the projects that we uh, are involved with. Um, more recently, we, uh, Nick and I, got together with a, a number of uh, data scientists um, from campus, including a number of machine learning experts, with the idea that we have a lot of cool technology, we can use it pretty well in some of our samples, but we still kind of get uh, strung up on the data end of things. And so we've kind of formed a little partnership, which has now got some seed funding behind it, to have a kind of multidisciplinary team that can kind of learn from each other internally uh, to kind of advance what we're trying to do with these kinds of tools, which is pretty important. Um, so for us at the moment, our mainstay technologies are fluorescence uh, cytometry, which is sort of news to no one, and mass cytometry. Uh, and if we take a little step back, the history of these technologies actually, is actually quite cool. Um, fluid cytometry obviously, ha obviously has very humble beginnings, uh, measuring sort of individual, you know, one or two colors on cells. Uh, this became sort of very prominent throughout the AIDS epidemic. Uh, and the key feature here is that in uh, 2010, we sort of hit the, what was at the time, the ceiling, 18 colors in a single panel uh, from uh, the, the laboratory of Mario Rotera. So this was the kind of max that could be achieved at the time. Uh, incidentally, in our facility, Adrian had just built the, world, the world's first 10 laser flow cytometer uh, because uh, I, I'm pretty sure for the bragging rights, but at any rate, that was a pretty cool uh, invention. But whilst this has kind of happened, mass cytometry came onto the scene in 2011, and all of a sudden we jumped from sort of, you know, 18 colors, which was kind of only done by the, the most, most advanced labs, to 34 colors done kind of with minimal effort in the way panels are designed. Uh, and so there's kind of an arms race that kicks off, I like to think of it. Um, Flow decides they're having none of that, and they build a machine that can do uh, up to 30 parameters, so 27 colors, uh, on a system which was called the X50 at the time and is now uh, known to most as the Symphony. Um, and this, you know, we kind of have a little back and forth. Mass cytometry gets a bit bigger, and then flow gets a little bit bigger, and then spectral comes into play. Uh, and it's quite an interesting history where each technology kind of forces the other one to innovate because otherwise uh, you kind of fall behind. Uh, but sort of along, alongside this is a technology area that we kind of often ignore if we kind of come from cytometry or we come from immunology, which is sort of the single cell sequencing space. Um, but also, actually, just a, a shameless plug that I'm going to put in here first. Um, I had the huge privilege, uh, along with uh, Dr. Helen McGuire at uh, the University of Sydney, of publishing a mass cytometry protocols book. Um, if you do mass cytometry or you're intending to, uh, I highly recommend getting it. I am a little biased in that opinion, I will admit, but it, it's good stuff. Uh, if you'd like elements of it, please send me an email. Um, so along with flow and mass cytometry, we have a parallel, hit, a parallel development of the single cell sequencing world. Um, this actually has a, a similar kind of timeline to what we've been discussing, starting with the sort of R, the sequencing of RNA from a, a literal cell, uh, individual cell, uh, to now doing sort of human cell atlas scale projects with, with hundreds of thousands of cells doing you know, quite deep sequencing in these samples. Uh, and this is kind of extended now to technologies which integrate multiple ways of looking at cells. So not only can this technology do uh, sort of transcriptomics, measuring the RNA of a cell, you can use oligo-conjugated antibodies to measure proteins on these cells as well. And so there are sort of limitations and, you know, tricks with getting that to work properly, but we're kind of approaching a multimodal single-cell uh, approach, which is really cool. 
So we now have this kind of set of three technologies which give us kind of flow, mass, and genomic cytometry, uh, as it were. Um, just by like a way of interest, I guess. If you look around hard enough, there are sort of papers emerging from groups doing actual single cell proteomics um, by actually measuring proteins on a per cell basis. Um, just for the record here, this is done at something like four cells an hour. So I'm not kind of recommending this as a mainstay technology. Um, but the fact that it, this is being published is actually quite encouraging. And this is, in fact, the second version of this particular technology. Um, but what I would like to talk about just briefly is when you think about these technologies, we kind of consider them to be competitors in a way. Like, well, you know, we do flow or we do mass or whatever. Um, but when we kind of think about the, the diverse sort of features of these technologies, we find them to be extremely complementary. Um, if we just think about the kind of different features of these assays, we can draw a little radar graph to kind of represent how these technologies fit together. So flow cytometry kind of comes in first and is kind of, this is a mainstay for immunology. Um, it's cheap, it's very effective, uh, the, e the sort of ease of access is actually quite reasonable. Uh, the difficulty here is, of course, that we're not measuring very many things per cell. Even with our largest panels, we're kind of getting to sort of, uh, you know, the 20s. There is a 44 color panel been reported recently, um, but that's kind of, you know, it's hard work to get to that kind of level, and at that point, you're questioning maybe why not using a different technology. Um, mass cytometry kind of shifts around the radar a little bit. So you're measuring more and more features per cell at a slower acquisition rate uh, with a higher cost. But it, it shifts the burden onto being able to see more things per cell without sort of completely break, uh, breaking the, the bank. By the time we get to single cell sequencing, we're measuring very few total numbers of cells. Hundreds of thousands of cells is, for many experiments, almost irrelevant. Uh, but in targeted sort of well-developed uh, well, uh, um, experiments, it can be extremely useful to have that amount of information on a per cell basis. Uh, and so this, th these technologies kind of fit together in a nice way that gives us uh, diverse applications, as it were. Um, and just as a, a sort of way of distilling that slide down to something slightly simpler, this is my kind of summary slide. But a key point I would like to make here is that only one of these technology, technologies currently give us the ability to sort cells. Uh, which is obviously flow cytometry. Uh, one of the things that all these other technologies in some way rely on, particularly sequencing, is that if we can't sort like populations of cells that are actually of interest to us, then we're kind of just wasting our time and our money. Um, being able to sort complex populations with large comprehensive panels is key to the, the success of these other technologies. So this is quite an important, I suppose, paradigm as we think about how these, how these work together. Um, but obviously, as kind of, you know, uh, I suppose from my own history, we kind of march forward with high dimensional single cell suspension assays, and we kind of have a lot of fun doing that, and that's really quite cool. Uh, but what we are missing always is the spatial element, how the microenvironment in the tissue relates to these complex phenotypes. Now, we're at an IMC meeting, so this is news to no one that this is important. Um, but obviously, we had sort of uh, the IMC and things like the, uh, the MIVI come out around the same time which gave us the ability to do high dimensional imaging in a, diff in a different kind of way. Um, so we have obviously the Hyperion uh, in our lab and we have a lot of fun imaging bits and pieces with this. This is a mouse lymph node. Um, and one of the strengths that I kind of like to point out to people with, uh, the, that start using the technology is many other comp competing or complementary technologies use some kind of cyclic process, either cycling imaging or cycling lab labeling in one way or another, which has its own set of disadvantages and challenges. One of the nice things with IMC is because we have one single stain and one single imaging event, there's kind of just less room for error with each kind of iterative cycle, if that makes sense. And I find this quite a helpful way to deal with some of our uh, imaging problems. Um, but again, along with this has had a parallel development of spatial transcriptomics. So doing sort of RNA sequencing or similar at the spatial level. Uh, and there's been a huge number of papers, a number of them in very prestigious journals or preprints, um, showing that you can do this kind of work um, now at quite a high resolution. Um, 10X just bought the company Spatial Transcriptomics recently and they're releasing that assay. Uh, Dennis, who's in the crowd here, is on this last paper doing high resolution uh, Spatial Transcriptomics at a resolution of something like two microns. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, which is an impressive feat. Uh, this then leads us all, obviously, to the data analysis. Um, this is kind of the like, challenge for everybody. Um, we have this particular uh, workflow, which I, I don't really want to detail, because frankly, the detail is boring. Um, but I think one of these things that we've noticed, particularly where I come from in Sydney, is that we don't train our immunologists now to kind of learn any kind of data analysis techniques, apart from kind of the classics. Um, most people I work with have never, never seen R or Python and have no kind of exposure to that world at all. 
Uh, and what we're, I suppose, just trying to do by way of kind of demonstration is that we are trying to find a way to kind of give the immunologists access to these computational tools in a way that is not going to stop them actually trying. Uh, if it's too difficult, uptake won't happen, which is actually pr a pretty reasonable thing. If it's just providing another kind of package tool that we have to sell them, then we obviously don't improve anything. No one learns from that process. Um, so we get to fiddle around a lot with sort of implementing our packages to create workflows that our users can, do, uh, can implement to do, basically get their work done in a hurry, uh, essentially, which is kind of fun. Um, so some of these protocols that we have, we put a lot of this online now. Um, so we have the scripts as well as the protocols on our sort of internal website, which we're now enabling people to log into or uh, register for, even if you're not one of our facility users. Um, we then obviously have some of the spatial uh, bits and pieces for you know, using things like Elastic for training, and most people here would have seen some of this at the workshops, but I wanted to make two points about this before I move on to the brain stuff. Uh, one is that I, for better or worse, I do a lot of my IMC analysis in Flojo. Um, I have this kind of, there's a lot of like tricky things about which is kind of the best software, which integrates all the different components. I end up in this situation where probably 80% 80, 80 of what I'm actually trying to do on any given experiment is like where is the cell in like an XY sort of uh, situation and like what's the phenotype of that cell. Um, both of those things I get from Flojo. And so I actually quite enjoy doing that work in Flojo. It just means that things are quite scalable. The hierarchical sort of gating for population management is quite good. Um, but there are a couple of little tricks because when, uh, I don't know if anyone's done this, but you, you take a, something out of you know, Histocat, you put it in Flojo and the Y axis gets inverted. And it's kind of like, I mean, it's not a huge deal, right? It doesn't matter so much, but you're kind of used to looking at the image you know, one way up, and then you're trying to recognize patterns that you think should be familiar when it's been flipped. Um, so we do a couple of little tricks in R so we can prep our, our, our files in a way which makes it more compatible with flow gel analysis, uh, which is just a kind of, I don't know, a helpful little addition uh, to the toolbox in terms of doing this work. Uh, but potentially more fun is you, we can start sort of harnessing elastic in some really cool ways. Um, one of the things about working with the brain, with brain tissue is we have a, a, quite a diverse range of cell types, none of which are kind of, uh, I suppose, similar to others. Neurons and microglia and astrocytes all have very different profiles, and segmenting these cells is a bloody nightmare. Uh, what you can do with elastic, for instance, is create sort of multiple layers of probability maps, and this is actually what this is. It's, I think, five colors, and what we're trying to do is segment cells that are within sort of high-density infiltrate areas, as well as cells, this is liver, not brain, just, just to clarify, but uh, finding cell, uh, creating probability maps for nuclear and cytoplasmic pixels from sort of the tissue parenchyma, as well as a separate uh, prediction map for those in the infiltrate, uh, which this is actually working kind of well so far, but there are definitely some challenges in here. But in the field, there's a real, a real difficulty with trying to find solutions that give you all these heterogeneous cell types in a single workflow. And I think the kind of machine learning uh, random forest classifier system that Elastic uh, implements is actually not a, not a bad way to start doing this. Um, if anyone would like to talk about this or tell me I'm wrong for doing it this way, I would love to have a chat. And I genuinely mean that. We might not be doing this correctly, but we're just giving it a shot. All right, so what does this all amount to for us is we study uh, viruses. So viral infection in the brain in particular. Um, if you consider what a mouse immune system looks like, here is my mouse immune system. Um, obviously we have kind of, uh, the immune system is quite diverse, it's very heterogeneous, and it's specialized across and within tissues as well. Uh, and a good example of this is the resident microglia that exist in the brain from very early on in life. Uh, if we introduce a virus into the, into the central nervous system, um, what you end up, with is, what end up with is a reactive response in, internally, initially, in the CNS. So the microglia react to the presence of the virus. You then end up with kind of peripheral signaling events which triggers immune mobilization in peripheral tissues. Uh, the upshot of all of this is that uh, you get cells coming out of the lymph nodes, the spleen, and the bone marrow. A number of these will transition to the brain, infiltrate into the brain, <coughs> resulting in a huge increase in the number of cells that we see here. Uh, and these are the cells ultimately that actually cause uh, the sort of greatest, greatest extent of disease and ultimately death in these animals. So this is a model of what we would call immune-mediated pathology. Uh, and this is all sort of work done from uh, the lab of Nicholas King uh, in sort of uh, decades of work on viral encephalitis and dealing with these models. Um, so it's a dynamic process across space, across time, and also across disease state, which is quite critical. So for a typical experiment for us, we'll ha we have something like this. We inoculate our mice with uh, West Nile virus, Zika virus, dengue, one of a number of uh, viral models using a couple of different options. 
Uh, we then can, uh, after, say, seven days of infection, this is a uniformly lethal disease in the West Nile and Zika cases, we can extract tissues at any of the days uh, throughout the infection time course. Uh, and then we can sort of label these up, prep them for mass or, or flow cytometry. In parallel, we'll often take tissues um, or sort of maybe half tissues and snap freeze them so that we can then go on to uh, doing IMC. And our panels, should be no surprised to kind of nobody, are largely built around the immune system or at least the hematopoietic system in my case. Uh, partly looking at cells in the bone marrow and how the hematopoietic system actually changes in the bone marrow in response to infection. Uh, but that's not something I'll talk about today. So what this looks like is in the uh, normal brain, whoops, in the normal brain, there's something like maybe one or 200,000 cells in the total mouse brain, uh, leukocytes rather. And these are almost entirely microglia. These are resident cells in the brain. They're supposed to be there to help combat uh, infection and keep the brain sort of healthy. Uh, so this is what this looks like on a Tisney plot. There's one small population and this looks pretty, uh, pretty, pretty reasonable. Uh, seven days after infection, we get an enormous expansion in the number of cells we see in the brain. Uh, and when we profile these in you know, a little bit more detail, the, the vast majority of these cells are lysoxy high inflammatory macrophages. Uh, these are derived from monocytes, cells that will emigrate from the bone marrow into the brain and become macrophages. And these are the cells that do most of the damage in this model. If we can keep those cells out of the brain, then the mice will survive much longer, longer than they would um, in any other situation. And we have a number of papers demonstrating different ways that we can keep these cells out. Uh, if we look at Zika virus encephalitis, which is a similar uh, flavivirus, um, this model has a remarkably similar kind of pattern. Uh, the brain starts with just micro, uh, microglia, with very few cells, and it you know, expands dramatically six days after infection, and the majority of these cells, again, are these inflammatory uh, macrophages. Um, and some work we've done recently, which got published like a uh, couple of months ago, I think now, was uh, showing that this is, a, uh, like, this is predominantly an innate response. It's an innate, really fast um, response to the presence of virus, not kind of an adaptive-induced response. Now, when we want to take this to imaging, because uh, we want to take this to imaging for a couple of key reasons, but the sort of forefront of that reason is that we know that we have these cells, they come into the brain, they cause all the damage. But there are still lingering questions about, like, at what point do, the, do these cells become the bad guys? Do they become bad guys before they've left the bone marrow? Is this once they've kind of transitioned into the brain, or does this depend on where in the brain they find themselves, the proximity of virus, et cetera? So we can do this by fluorescence microscopy. We can find our infectious foci and our infiltrating cells in green, uh, green and red, respectively, here. Uh, and what ends up happening is that we get kind of distributions of infiltrate throughout the brain. There's no kind of uniform or necessarily exactly reproducible pattern, uh, but we do find this kind of throughout almost all of the brain apart from the cerebellum. Now, we obviously want to transition this to IMC, but there are some challenges there. If we consider um, the, so imaging a mouse lymph node, like I showed before, something like four or five hours of imaging time, we'll get it done. So that's a pretty reasonable sort of set of time uh, to, to do that. If we wanted to do an entire mouse brain, for instance, um, the math works out something like 200 and something hours of imaging time. And I mean, my boss is here somewhere and uh, you know, he would have to sign off on that experiment and that's probably not gonna happen. Um, but what we can do, for instance, is sort of hack the system a little bit. So if we know that there are specific areas that we want to target for this kind of imaging, we can use either serial sections or stay in the actual same section with both fluorescent and metal tagging antibodies. Uh, figure out the regions of interest that actually matter to us and in a kind of high impact targeted area approach uh, do our imaging mass cytometry. Um, the data, as you would imagine, looks quite pretty. Um, this is work, all of this next stuff is work done by Alana Spiteri, who's a uh, grad student in Nick, uh, Nick's lab working with Nick and I. Um, when we, uh, so historically in Nick's lab, there's been this kind of long running hypothesis that uh, the, these, this virus only infects neurons. But profiling that in, at kind of a, in kind of a scalable way is actually quite tricky because they're not usually doing viral stains alongside all these additional markers. Um, what's nice with the IMC technology is now we can actually just, you know, kind of blanket hit, say, well, what does NS1, the viral protein, correlate with? Uh, we find that in the brain it correlates extremely um, strongly with uh, new N, which is a neuronal uh, marker, uh, but then it, it completely avoids other markers like C11B, which marks microglia, um, GFAP for astrocytes, et cetera. So we know that this is a, a, a virus which affects neurons only, very exclusively. But so we can use kind of all the, all the fancy tricks with have, we have with IMC. This is an example for, of a uh, sort of string of virally infected cells throughout the hippocampus. Um, if we sort of pick some areas, we can do our kind of fancy analysis where we do our segmentation. We try to understand what phenotypes emerge from this, uh, from, uh, from this sort of region that we've picked 
and we see how the phenotype relates to essentially, in this case, the presence or absence of virus in that area. And sure enough, we can see the microglia, we can see infiltrating cells before they've reached an infectious foci and after they've reached an infectious foci. So now we're starting to be able to map at what point these cells sort of gain key, character, uh, key characteristics which you know, drive them to be pathological. Uh, a lot of Alana's work has been involved in uh, tracking the differentiation of microglia over time, uh, which is kind of a characteristic response pattern to uh, the to virus. This click thing is not working super well. There we go. Uh, microglia start as these kind of like, uh, I suppose, a cell body with a whole lot of little spindles coming off the side, which is reasonably straightforward. And as they become activated, they start to look a bit more like a rough immune cell, a bit more like a macrophage. And being able to track this is actually very helpful because we don't see this effect on uh, suspension, uh, suspension flow or site off. But we can obviously track this in IMC. Uh, this is obviously, this change is kind of induced by the presence of virus in the brain, uh, which is quite helpful, so we can do this simultaneously. Uh, but one of the key things here is that we can now start to do this quantitatively. We can, with, I will say, great difficulty, segment microglia in the brain. Uh, it's not always perfect, but I think it's fairly reasonable the way we're doing it at the moment. And Alana has identified for, I think even the first time in our group, a key kinetic change uh, in terms of the distribution of microglia in the brain during the, uh, the time course, uh, during the infection course, which we hadn't seen before with our suspension data. All right, so uh, in summary, um, the, uh, I don't know, the immune system is complicated. Um, using high dimensional tools allows us to make it a little bit less complicated as we try to understand what's going on, and we can then start to try and perturb the way that disease uh, occurs, trying to you know, uh, benefit the patient or the mouse in our case. Um, some of the computational tools that we have are very challenging, and this one, oh, this is not supposed to be animated, but that's fine. Uh, Giovanna, who is a, a uh, data science graduate student with our group, has developed an algorithm called Chronoclust, which essentially, rather than just clustering the data and seeing how the phenotypes shake out, this will cluster data on day zero and then integrate new data for each subsequent day of a time course and build it into an existing framework. Um, this is quite a cool tool. It's kind of in early stages of development, but we've published this now if anyone's interested in trying it out. Um, in the future, this projects out to challenges like um, scalable discovery solutions, but also things like um, uh, data alignment and um, sort of multimodal data integration. And these are kind of part of larger challenges that are part of things like the Human Cell Atlas at the moment, and it's kind of worth considering. Uh, my final point I just want to say is that, um, so we now have our sort of analysis protocols on our website in a way that you can access if you're interested. So that's our kind of core facility website. And if you go there, we have all our kind of standard analysis pipelines. We have our IMC analysis protocols uh, and these things which kind of you can get access to now if you're interested or you like it. So these are the people I'd like to thank. Uh, thank in particular um, Alana, who's uh, I showed most of her data today. She, she, she's been kind of driving IMC for our group for the, for the, last, uh, the last couple of years, uh, as well as uh, Nick and Adrian and Barbara and Diana, who's here as well, uh, and Helen back, at, back in Sydney. So thank you very much, and I'll take any questions.